Hi, this is Dr. Pelletieri with an online lecture on gene expression. Um, I think gene expression is one of the most important topics in all of biology. And I say that because um, you can select just about any biological phenomenon that you want, and it's likely you'll be able to trace that back either directly or at least indirectly um, to gene expression or changes in gene expression. So it's a really important um, topic and, and one that's critical for biology majors to understand. Okay, so this um, little mini lecture is just going to cover the very basic um, aspects of gene expression. I would encourage you to spend some time um, with your textbook reading about this so you can go into a little more detail and, and um, learn some more advanced aspects of this. So this, this is just going to cover the basics. Okay, before we get started with gene expression, um, let me begin by reminding you what genes are. Um, as you may remember, genes are the, the fundamental units of heredity, and they are what determine um, specific characteristics of an organism. So each gene will be responsible for, um, for um, giving rise to one or more characteristics of an organism. Now, um, you may know that um, the, the physical form of genes is deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short, as shown here. Um, DNA, of course, has this, this famous um, chemical structure. It's the double helix. So you have these, these two backbones um, that are made up of sugar phosphate molecules, and those wrap around one another. And then there are these little um, rungs of the ladder made up of nucleotides, and we'll come back to those um, in a minute. Now, um, for, for organisms like humans, our cells are, are called eukaryotic cells. Um, they have a nucleus, and the DNA is not is normally um, not in, in this loose double helix form. It's actually compacted really, really tightly so, um, into what are called chromosomes. So the DNA gets wrapped around proteins and then um, condensed into a really small um, space. So it, it forms these highly condensed chromosomes that can fit into the nucleus of the cell. But if we unwound the DNA in, in one of the chromosomes and stretched it out, this is what it would look like. And the genes are, um, are present on the chromosomes in kind of a, a, an arrangement like beads on a string. So you'll have one gene, and then you have a space, and then you have another gene, and then another space, etc. Um, so these, these regions in between the genes are called intergenic regions. Um, but you'll have um, all these genes present as well, spaced out along the chromosome one after the next. Okay, now if we zoom in a little bit, and, and let's look at one of these genes, let's say gene one. We'll zoom in on that. Um, here again, you have the, the two backbones shown in blue here. Those are the sugar phosphate um, backbones of the DNA molecule. And then the A's, T's, G's, and C's in here, these are the nucleotides. They're carbon, nitrogen, ring-shaped um, molecules, and they're oriented toward the middle of the double helix. Um, so I want to um, zoom in on a couple of these and show you what those look like in a little more detail. We'll look at the chemical structure. So A always pairs with T. Um, a is short for adenine, and T is short for thymine. And anytime you have an A on one strand, you know that there's going to be a T in that position on the complementary, the other, the other strand. Okay. And G pairs with C. G is short for guanine and C for cytosine. And anytime you have a G on one strand, you know that there's going to be a C on the complementary strand. And the reason A pairs with T and G pairs with C is that um, these, these ring-shaped molecules are able to form hydrogen bonds with one another. And A, it, um, when A is paired with T, it's able to form these, these two hydrogen bonds, and G is able to form three hydrogen bonds with C. So here's the AT um, base pair, the, the, these two nucleotides, oriented toward the, the center of the double helix, and then the dashed lines are representing the hydrogen bonds between these two molecules. Okay, so you have two hydrogen bonds between A and T, and three between G and C. Now, these hydrogen bonds play a key role um, in, in giving rise to this double helix structure. They, they hold the, the molecule together, the two strands of DNA together. But they're also really important in that um, the sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's as we move along the, the DNA molecule, that carries information, and that's what 
allows the genes to um, code for a, a particular function or a particular trait. And the way that that, that information gets read and gets converted into some kind of um, um, trait is through gene expression. Okay? So um, genes, you'll, you'll hear people often refer to genes as being um, kind of a, a blueprint for life, a blueprint for how to make a cell. And I think that's, um, that's a, a reasonably good analogy. One of the ways that analogy works pretty well is that um, just like you, if you have a, a blueprint for a house, um, just like that blueprint isn't going to be very much use to you if you're out lost in the woods and it's, it's raining out um, and you need a place to get warm and dry. So too, um, genes, they're useful and they carry information, but they don't, they don't have um, any, any intrinsic value in and of themselves. That information has to get read, it has to get converted into a, a tangible, usable form. And the, the functional form of genes is proteins. So the genes are encoding specific proteins, and the proteins are the things that will, um, they, they, they form particular structures in the cell and they have particular functions in the cell. Enzymes, for example, that catalyze biochemical reactions are usually proteins. Okay, so the information present within the gene uh, needs to be converted into a, a functional output in the form of a protein. And the series of processes that convert this information in the gene into a protein is referred to as gene expression. This is where this, this um, topic comes into play. Okay, so before I, I explain the steps involved in gene expression, there's one more thing I need to, to tell you to help you understand this. And that is that um, the proteins encoded by the genes are made up of um, molecules called amino acids. There are 20 different naturally occurring amino acids. Um, you can read about these in, in your textbook and, and see their chemical structures. Um, there's methionine and proline and lysine and leucine and glycine, etc. Um, and those amino acids are, are linked together to make these structures called polypeptide chains. So you'll have a, a string of amino acids. I'm, I'm just representing them here as um, different colored circles, but they're all linked together by these special bonds called peptide bonds to make up um, polypeptide chains. And these polypeptide chains will fold up to make proteins. And the sequence of amino acids within the, um, the polypeptide chain determines the overall three-dimensional shape of the protein when that polypeptide chain starts folding up. And in turn, the shape, the three-dimensional conformation of, of the protein will determine how it's going to function in the cell. What can it do? What can it bind to? Etc. So the sequence of amino acids present within the protein is a key determinant of its structure and in turn um, its function. And as, how does this relate to gene expression? Well, the sequence of amino acids present within a protein is determined by the sequence of nucleotides of A's, T's, G's, and C's um, within the gene. And so when we talk about gene expression, ultimately what's happening here is that this code, this sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's is being interpreted in red to instruct the creation of a polypeptide chain with a specific sequence of amino acids. Okay, so this decoding or gene expression um, process happens in two key steps. And these are referred to as transcription and translation. And let me walk you through um, what happens in each of these steps. So first of all, we have a particular gene that's, that's going to be expressed that we want to make a, uh, the cell is going to make a protein corresponding to that particular gene. Um, first of all, there's a, a little kind of molecular machine called RNA polymerase, and it will read through and make a copy, a single-stranded copy of um, this particular gene that's called RNA, um, specifically messenger RNA, or mRNA for short. Now, if you remember, um, back to the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned that um, these genes are, are spaced kind of like um, beads on a string. They have that kind of arrangement on a chromosome. So each chromosome will have hundreds or thousands of genes, and there'll be gene one, and then a space, and then gene two, and then another space, and gene three, et cetera. So, when RNA polymerase comes through and makes a copy of a particular gene that's being expressed, it just makes a copy of that gene 
and not the intergenic regions and other genes on either side. So it will read through, it un unwinds this double helix and reads through and makes this single-stranded messenger RNA or mRNA copy. Now, the mRNA differs from DNA in three um, primary respects. First of all, as I said, it's single-stranded rather than double-stranded. Secondly, um, the sugar molecules in this sugar phosphate backbone are slightly different than in the, um, in the DNA. So that's why I'm, I'm illustrating this sugar phosphate backbone in a different color to denote that it's chemically um, different than in DNA. And then the third major difference is that um, in RNA, the thymines, the Ts, are replaced by a close chemical cousin called uridine, um, symbolized by U. So rather than um, a TG, the sequence here in the RNA will be AUG. Okay, so with transcription, the RNA polymerase comes through and makes this single-stranded mRNA copy of a particular gene. And then the next step is translation. There's, there's also splicing that has to happen in here in, in a lot of, um, of organisms, and you can read about that in your textbook. Um, but the, the next major step is translation. And this is where the actual decoding um, process happens. And um, translation is carried out by another kind of molecular machine called the ribosome. What the ribosome does is to read through um, from the five prime end to the three prime end of the mRNA, and it reads through three nucleotides at a time. So each set of three nucleotides is referred to as a codon, and that um, sequence of, of three letters or three nucleotides um, signifies that a particular amino acid should be inserted at that position in the corresponding polypeptide chain. So what the ribosome is doing is it reads through the messenger RNA molecule, it, it reads three nucleotides at a time and interprets, um, it, it decodes, um, interprets that AUG, for example, um, indicates that a methionine should be placed at that position in the polypeptide chain. And then it will get to the next three letters, the next codon, and decode that and put in the appropriate um, amino acid. So the ribosome is going through and bringing in the um, appropriate amino acids, and it also catalyzes the formation of the peptide bonds between these amino acids to make up the polypeptide chain. Okay, and then ultimately, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the sequence of, of amino acids is going to cause the polypeptide chain to fold up and adopt a particular three-dimensional conformation of the, the protein that corresponds to this gene. And that will, that three-dimensional structure um, is going to be critical to its function in the cell. So to summarize, gene expression um, is the, the process whereby the genetic, the information contained within the DNA code is converted through transcription via RNA polymerase and translation via the ribosome um, into a functional protein that will, will have some um, important role in a cell.